Well, good morning, and thank you very much for joining us on this morning's webinar on preparing LiDAR data for use with ArcGIS 10.1's data interoperability extension. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dale Lutz. And my name is Dmitry Bob. And we're very pleased to be able to present to you the results of several years of hard work at our labs here at Safe Software. And um, Dimitri, in particular, has played a key role in shaping the functionality. And I know he's excited to show it to you today. Aren't you, Dimitri? Oh, I'm very excited. Good. We're also joined by our friends Steve and Mark from Professional Services here at Safe. And they're standing by, fingers at the ready, to answer all the questions you may come up with. So don't hold back. Ask lots of questions as we're going along. They'll answer you in real time. If you stump them, they'll answer you later today. And if you're really lucky, they might choose your question for us to talk about even more at the end of our webinar time today in about 50 minutes time or so. So who are we? We are Safe Software. Why are we doing a webinar about Esri uh, Data Interop? Well, it's because we are the ones that actually build that in conjunction with Esri, and then they put their label on it and sell it. And so we're really happy with that partnership. I don't know if my friend Bruce Harold is on this morning. He may be. He's the product manager over at Esri and our colleague that works closely with us on this. And, uh, and so, again, if you have questions about stuff, we may even defer to him and put him on the, on the hook like we did two days ago uh, when we did just a general data interop webinar. I should mention that. Uh, later on, you'll see links to our archive of webinars. Two, two days ago, Dimitri and I were here bright and early. Two days in one week. Pretty hard week, isn't it, Dimitri? Yeah, coming here at 7 o'clock is quite hard. We're, Dimitri and I are more really interested in kind of doing the 8 p.m. shift. Uh, that would be easier for us than the 7 a.m. shift. But anyway, we did a webinar on the data interop in general, all the things that are new in it with a series of different demos. And that's now on our archive. And you can download the toolboxes and things um, from our archives there. The data interoperability extension is based upon the FME, which is Safe Software's product, and it's a pretty full-featured subset. It has a, basically all the functionality that we're legally able to give to Esri is in there, and so um, things that FME can do definitely apply to data interop. Data interop things also can be done by FME. This is the extension itself. Again, it was, uh, I think it's at least eight years old, maybe even more, can't recall any longer. I know it came out with 9.0, and so it's been around a long time, and uh, a lot of people out there have it, and we at SAFE look forward to even supporting that community even more than we have in the past. Um, certainly, uh, those users are, are absolutely our users as much as um, FME users, and we uh, want to support them in every way. One way is by hosting webinars like this. Wow, is it time for a poll already, Dimitri? Yeah, let's begin with our first poll. All right. So what is the poll? So do you currently use data interoperability extension for LIDAR point cloud processing? All right. And so we should have the polls active. And um, looking at the results coming in, whoops. Uh, wow, we have a fair number of folks that don't use either FME or the data interrupt. So thanks very much for joining us this morning. And we do hope that you'll uh, understand some of the kinds of functionality that's available in both those products by the time we're done. And uh, I think that there are some more introductory kinds of webinars coming up. This isn't particularly an introduction to data interop in general. We're going to be zooming in on the functionality related to the, the LiDAR side of things. But along the way, you should uh, get at least some idea about how it works. Okay. I think we'll close the poll there and share the results. So um, overwhelmingly, folks are not yet doing it, Dimitri. Yeah, but I see people plan to use it. That's like crazy. That's great. That's great. So you're going to get a good jump on what, uh, what's possible as a result of what we're going to be showing today. So thanks very much. And for those of you that um, don't have either of them or don't use them yet, we hope that you'll learn some things and have something available in your mind so that if you run into these kinds of problems, you'll be well positioned. So again, what does data interop let us do? It lets us convert, transform, and integrate, and even share spatial data of, of all kinds of types. And the bubble there gives you a sense of the um, breadth of the data types that are available uh, to be shared. And so we have these different data types in our tool belt. And here they come pouring in. Um, Anything we should say about those, Dimitri? 
Well, uh, we can move uh, freely between all those kinds of data. You don't stay only within, G, uh, within GIS or CAD. You can move data from GIS to CAD and uh, vice versa. You can read databases and send them to web or read GML, XML data and uh, rasterize it. So everything is possible. Dmitri and I are quite interested also in 3D and BIM. And maybe we should do a webinar on that someday. Oh, that would be great. Yes. We did actually a 3D webinar um, maybe about a month ago. It's archived on our website. But we could do one specifically more on BIM and how did interop works. We do have many customers out there doing things. I'll tip my hat to my friends at the University of Massachusetts who are really one of the leaders there. And of course, today we're focusing on point clouds. But you will be using some of these other data types, won't you, in your demos? Yes, that's, uh, yeah, I will be showing you how it works. Yes. And so, just by way of introduction, I know we have about a third of the folks that, uh, that don't have either product. Within FME and the Data Interop, there is this application called Workbench that lets us design graphical data flows. And our argument is that you may solve the types of problems you would otherwise do in Workbench by writing code, but my goodness, using Workbench is going to get you there a lot faster. And I mean two orders of magnitude faster. So you draw these diagrams. The data starts on the left. It goes row by row or object by object through these blue things we call transformers, which rearrange, massage, pound the data, do interesting operations. I believe in our webinar last week, we showed that there's more than 300 different transformers. Over the it's like 360. Feet, yeah. yeah, something like that. So there's lots of them. And so the key to using this productively is knowing those transformers. Dimitri is going to show us today a number of the transformers specifically around point clouds. There must be at least 10 that are specific. Or maybe is it around that? Maybe yeah, a little less? That. Close to that. Um, to do all kinds of interesting operations on point clouds. All of this to help us get our data absolutely ready to be used in our final, um, as a final output. In our case today, always by ArcGIS, I think. Yeah. In terms of the ArcGIS environment, when you create these workspaces, they're called spatial ETL tools. You can have parameters on them. In this case, Dimitri is showing us you've sh you've published or made available um, what the tiling number of tiles, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But then uh, you don't have to run this environment every time uh, in order to use this tool. You can just wrap it up or have it as a simple arc, uh, arc tool in ArcGIS. Right, so on this um, page here, you can see that he's got a toolbox. I think you must have done this at the Survey Summit. Is that right, Dimitri? Yeah. So um, here's, what, about six or seven of these spatial ETL tools. As far as ArcGIS is concerned, these are geoprocessing tools like any other. They're like Python scripts or something else, only they're built with the data interop extension. and when you double click them, you get a chance to fill in the parameters, which means they can be put inside Model Builder. Have you ever done that? Uh, no, not yet. But I know customers that do. So you can put it inside Model Builder and build up more complex geoprocessing where these things are inside. Why are these tools different than geoprocessing? These tools work one row, one object at a time. Geoprocessing typically works one table at a time. And so there's a good complement between the two. I think that's it for me to give the intro. Dimitri, you're ready to get going and show yeah. some demos. Let's begin with our first demo. All right. Just to give you a taste of um, workbench and data interoperability. Let me start with, start, uh, with creating a new spatial ETL tool. Um, uh, maybe let me describe our goal. We got some data from the, our customer. They, they planned some rep uh, reconstruction project. So they supplied us with um, project boundary in uh, DGN with ortho photo and with some uh, point cloud data in oh. form of XYZ files. So these aren't last files. Yeah, we can have. Uh, yeah. So that could be a problem. OK, so we have uh, XYZ files, point cloud XYZ. We have such a format. Okay, that's that's less of a problem now. Yes, okay. Now, let's go and pick all those files. You can pick more than one? I can pick all of them. Okay. Okay, in our parameters, we have a preview pane down here, and you can see that our, our files have a field name, so we can say that 
they have these field names. Now we can assign uh, this field of column names to a uh, point cloud component such as coordinates or intensity. And this is the list of the components that we can map uh, in our point clouds. Okay, next. And our customer asks us to make a last file. Okay. This uh, will bring up uh, this workbench environment. Um, with a reader on the left side and the writer on the right side uh, going from uh, uh, XYZ to LAS. Let's put our output into output folder. There we go. Here we are. Okay. Lots of stuff rolls by. Okay, so let's check our output. So what did we get? Lots of files, uh, last files. But our customer would like uh, to have just a single file. So one, one thing I'll point out to the folks that haven't seen this before, that line has now got a 20 on it. That means 20 point clouds went flowing by, one for each file. So how can we uh, make a single uh, point cloud? So we have to use this thing that we call transformer. And um, to combine a few point clouds into a single one, we need something called combiner. We just start typing and we get something what is... Uh, needed point cloud combiner. Then we can give another name, say project. Ah. Okay. Let me clean the the all these files. We don't need them anymore. And run this again. There it goes. Oh only one was output now. Okay. Let's have a look what uh, what we what we got. Did you make a last D? Oh, right. You forgot. That's one thing. If Okay, go to the directory, Dimitri, and just show the folks at home what's there right now. It's just a project. That's an LAS. But to use it in ArcGIS, we really need to make a last D, a last data set at the same time. And how hard is that to do? We just type here uh, last D file name. So we're asking it, in addition to producing the last files, it'll produce a last data set as well. So we're going to run that baby again. With luck, let's go to the directory again and take a look. Ah, oh, that's good news. File. Okay, let's have a look what we have. Oh, that's convenient. Whoa, okay. So this is how quickly we can make a single last file from multiple XYZ files. But, well, we don't need uh, such a big file because a project happens somewhere in the middle of this. That's right, there was a Bentley microstation file with so a boundary. Let me add another uh, reader that will read this DGN file. So you're going to pull in a DGN as well as those ASCII things? Yeah. Okay. So what should we do? We have somehow, uh, we have to clip this point cloud. So, so let me clip. guess. Yeah, I'm trying to type clip. And we get a clipper transformer. So our Boundary in DGN is a clipper, and our point cloud is a clip P. And you want the inside piece? Uh, yeah, we need a clipped piece, the piece that well, that is inside. Oh, it's going again. Now, do you have to? Yeah, I will remove this and run this. Again, so oh, okay. Now it is clipped, but we also got a TIFF image and ortho image from our customer. So why don't we try to do something interesting? Why don't we try to enrich uh, our point cloud with some color? Right, because the original data did not have color; it was uh, only had intensity. Yeah, just traditional uh, 
point cloud. So for that, we have a um, spe special transformer called point cloud on raster component setter. That's a mouthful. <laughs> I think that's the longest transformer name. In I think it is actually, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, OK. So, and let me run this. Do you need to take that off of there again? Yeah. Are we done? Yes, uh, almost. So what's doing is basically for every point in the point cloud is looking down in that raster and lifting a color out. So this should be in color. OK, let me just switch. <laughs> it's not. No, 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 because, well, uh, uh, arc scene is, uh, arc JS is very rich. It has it, the very rich yes. capabilities of displaying our point cloud. What is it? Uh oh, uh, what happened? We don't got no. Oh, no, 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 no. That's wrong. Button. Maybe. Uh, Let me route it to our inspection application. I wonder if you have to um, write it to a new file name or something. Maybe. Uh, yes, probably. I have to. It might be cached. To, yes. So now. What Dimitri did there was run it to our own inspection application that's part of the data intro. Oh, it's nice and colorful in here. So that looks quite sweet. So why don't we um, just name it something different or shut down our scene and come back again? Okay, let's try. Is it shut down? Yes. Okay. I see it working there now. Oh, that's. I hear Dimitri's fan on his computer firing up. So there's the data inspector, shows it fine again. And we're running it again. And our scene should be happy. There we go. So now we'll try it one last time. And we aren't expecting it to be in color until we do that. And there it is. OK. So the lesson is, if you're rewriting the same file, you have to uh, either change the file names or shut our scene down. Um, so probably we would recommend, if you're experimenting with things, you use the inspection application inside of the data interop until you get it looking right, and then route it to the final output. So that's good news. Are you done there, Dimitri? Uh, well, uh, uh, this is wonderful. This is exactly what our customer needs. but. Uh, for uh, for the bosses and for general public, uh, we would like to create something uh, simple what they can could view on their computers. And what is uh, very simple and available to everyone is uh, PDF 3D. Right. So why don't we try to generate a surface out of our points? Okay. Then uh, we can also clip. Uh, our image image to the same extent as the point cloud. Right. Okay, and so we've got then, a surface. Oh, we got, got a red thing on that surface thing, Dimitri. What's yeah, that? I can see it. Yeah, we, can, we should set uh, surface tolerance. Let's set it to 5. Okay. And now we should uh, add this image to the surface as a texture. Right. For that, we have a transformer called appearance adder. So we take a surface to geometry and the image, so we check whether our parameters are correct. So yeah, looks you, good. And now we have to add another writer called PDF uh, 3D. Let's send our output to this folder. You can name it something, I guess. Uh, Project.pdf. <coughs> Looking good. OK. One thing about this demo, you get to type the word project a lot of times. OK, so. All right, just with those few things, that you're, you're claiming you're going to have a PDF for me? Well, I hope to get a PDF to this, uh, in this folder. So that means seconds. we can produce two outputs at the same time with the data interop. We're actually producing some LAS, a LAS file and a PDF. There's, is there any limit to the number of outputs you can do? No. no. OK, just your imagination. OK, let me open this PDF and have a look. What? We have got 
Whoa. Whoa, a 3D PDF, which you can send to anyone, and as long as they have uh, Adobe Reader, they can see this. No extra plugins required, just make it and view it. So all of this shows how quickly you're able to take a pretty difficult input, which was an XYZ set of files, and we're able to quickly produce something that's of use to uh, to any any end consumer, both a technical one with the last file and a non, like my mom, for example, could make use of that PDF. Okay, so this is the end of our first demo, and let me return back to our presentation. Okay. So uh, here at SAFE, uh, we view a point clouds uh, very similar to rasters. Uh, but uh, with some difference, uh, differences. Uh, rasters are regularly spaced uh, sets of points where we always know where you have your data, not uh, so much with uh, point clouds. So, uh, Dale, uh, how about uh, this uh, saying? Uh, that's probably the best uh, professional joke of the decade. Yeah, we like to say that LiDAR and point clouds are rasters gone wild. It's a new video series that Dimitri and I are going to put out. I'm sure it'll be very popular. Yeah, so there are, uh, so what are the, these uh, mystic behaviors that we observe in point clouds? Huge data volume. So it's not unusual to see uh, files going to a billion points or uh, say 20, 40 gigabytes. Uh, spacing is irregular, so it's really hard to know where you have your point. You may have some dense areas and some areas with no points at all. You have uh, multiple returns uh, at the same point. Uh, you have many measurements per return, so such as classification, intensity, uh, and uh, scan direction, angle, and, and so on. So here we show how we can inspect all those uh, things in our inspect inspection application. Uh, usually uh, in GIS world, we uh, use rasters that are taken from above, from, uh, but uh, point clouds can be collected from, uh, from the air or on the ground uh, or uh, on mobile uh, scanners. So on that one, I'll just mention for me, when I look at these things, I, I'm so used to always having a fixed location point. So when we look at rasters, we know where the camera was. When you look at a point cloud, you can pan and zoom around, and you don't even know necessarily where the thing was collected from, other than maybe some things are in shadows. And so this makes these kinds of scenes absolutely normal within point cloud data sets. So what are the solutions that we uh, offer for our customers? Uh, before we continue, let's... Uh, launch another poll. So okay. which point cloud formats are you interested in? Right. I would like to know what you work with. Or point cloud, yes. With. Because of course um, LAS is the main one, uh, but there's many other ones that, that people use. I know uh, our friends at the LiDAR News are quite interested in E57. Uh, we don't have E57 in this version, but it is coming. Um, POD, that's the point tools guys bought by Bentley. We do support their stuff as well. And um, let's see what else. Actually, we don't mention, you can talk about compressed LiDAR? Yes. I see our friend Martin Eisenberg, the uh, frankly, and I will say a genius guy that's a, a LiDAR expert is tuned in to our webinar this morning. He has made available a wonderful compression code that's free and being adopted quite a bit. And that's in here as well. So um, let's look. Actually, it's nice to see a fair number of folks using those um, those new formats, the E57, RDB, Terascan, all of those are going to be in the next data interop. We've already built them in-house, they'll be in the next FME, and they'll be rolled into a future service pack of the data interop. So I'm going to close the poll there. Thanks very much for your votes. And we will share the results. So what does that say to you, Dimitri? Lots of Oracle, actually. I mean, I know that's not very not percentage-wise, but um, we we haven't known how many people are doing point clouds in Oracle here at Safe. We do support that, and um, if any of you are using that, we'd love to get feedback from you on how we operate. And I know Steve, our friend uh, online here at Safe, is one of our Oracle experts, and he'd be really keen to uh, to discuss your your results with that. But I'm very interested that 20% are on, on that bottom row. So the point is that 
all the formats that we have or will uh, will be adding uh, into the next release uh, will be used. Yes. So, that's, so that's we're great. very pleased. Thanks very much for that intel. All right, back to our uh, talk. So oh. yes. Uh, so uh, as you could see, these are the formats that we currently support. Uh, ASCII XYZ, as you could see, uh, we can uh, read practically any uh, delimited ASCII file, Oracle point tools, and last with more formats coming. Uh, we also support uh, compressed LAS uh, files. Uh, we just have to specify whether we would like to compress files uh, on the writer side or not and get them compressed. Just to show you the difference, uh, these uh, are the color LAS. Uh, about two and a half times and maybe four times for uh, intensity based last files and it can go even higher up to ten times smaller files. Currently uh, RJS does not support uh, LAZ files uh, but you definitely can read them and write them with uh, uh, data interoperability. And I know that our friend Martin has uh, a website I think LAS tools or we can, Martin if you want to uh, text us in there with, with the site, we'll send it out to everybody that has utilities around this. Oh, there it is, in front of my nose, lazip.org. It's on the slide, I should learn to read. But anyway, um, you can find there tools related to this thing as well. You, he's got a list of all the organizations making available data in that format, and it's a very large amount because, hey, um, when you can distribute data at one-tenth the size, a gigabyte here, a gigabyte here, a gigabyte there, it does add up. So, of course, we can uh, inspect data. Uh, the power of, of FME is that you can, or uh, data interoperability, that you can bring uh, 240 uh, formats together and display them in a single uh, viewing application. So, now before we start with the uh, operation uh, on Point Cloud, so let us ask you what is your typical operation with Point Cloud? All right, so here we go with the polls. So this is really asking, now that you have point cloud data, and I know that the shelves out there are filled with point cloud data, um, what is it that you guys uh, would like to actually do with it? And, and as we began this project two or three years ago at SAFE, we realized that people had a lot of data that they really weren't doing much with. And so um, we're really happy. I know my friend Gene Rowe of LiDAR News phrased it that the LiDAR data used to have the power over the people, but with tools like the data interop, now the people have the power over the data. So uh, let's go a little bit more, and um, we'll probably close it in one, two, and three. So we'll close and we'll share. So uh, like interesting stuff, the data enrichment side of things, definitely an area that we continue to put effort into. Um, surface generation. Obviously very important, RGS can do that, uh, data interrupt can do it to some degree as well. Tiling and clipping is really where we love to live. Yes, we yep. really put a lot of work into that, as well as the whole splitting and combining. Those things, are you going to show some of yes, that? Yes, yes, you will see this. Okay, yeah. and the coloring we showed already. Yes. And um, Dimitri, I know that you don't want to talk about it today, but in the next one, we have lots of things that can help with the enrichment. We've got an actual um, expression evaluator that can do amazing things. But we're not talking about that today. You've got to come back in six months and you'll see that one. So um, thanks very much for that. Feature extraction, that's the one thing we don't do anything with yet. But we're really uh, curious uh, to know whether uh, you would like to use uh, uh, feature extraction in uh, data interoperability. We do have a PhD guy on staff that knows how to do that. So maybe we should actually get him to, uh, to work on that. So thanks very much. So what's next, Dimitri? OK, let's go through uh, our uh, transformation capabilities. Of course, uh, FME uh, and data interoperability, interoperability can reproject data. Uh, one of our uh, customers asked whether we can, can support geocentric coordinates and orthometric heights. Without this support, we uh, couldn't uh, satisfy them, so we added that to uh, data interoperability. And just to show you a nice picture here, I took just a bounding box for uh, the Earth and a JPEG image and turned them into a point cloud in geocentric coordinates. So this is a point cloud uh, to scale. Uh, of, yeah. 
we of course we can tile. One very obvious reason for tiling is making smaller files for uh, delivery. Uh, but I also found that tiling is very useful for uh, improve, uh, improving performance. You can tile your data, process each tile separately using parallel processing uh, and then combine results back and that you can be much faster than just uh, working on a single big point cloud. And for that you use Tyler Transformer. We can clip. Uh, it is a little bit slower than tiling but then you get a precise area that you need. Here I buffered the road center lines with say well, 200 uh, feet buffer and get this shape uh, uh, and you already saw this clipper working on in, in, in our first demo. Uh, we also were asked whether we could re read and process really huge point clouds such well such as one billion point or even more uh, and yes we can tile it, clip it, to bring it to manageable uh, pieces uh, so that other software could work with them and I will show some numbers later today. So this is uh, the few uh, tiling or clipping uh, examples. Uh, we also support uh, cubic clipping. So you can have some solids which you uh, can use for uh, clipping your point cloud. And this example shows a simple filtering technique where I make stacks of uh, one meter boxes and analyze how many points I have per box and keep on with those that are above a certain uh, parameter. So here is an example how, how it could look like after filtering. I don't say that FME is a great feature extraction tool, but sometimes you can do something like this. Uh, of course, you can thin points uh, from a point cloud. If you, if you have really huge point clouds, you can make an overview, or for example, you combine lots of point cloud for a county or for a state, and you would like to make some overview point cloud, we can do that with point cloud thinner transformer uh, by saying, keep me every nth point, say every second point, or say, I don't want, I, I would like to have no more than 10, billion, uh, 10 million points. We can generate surface, and you already saw that. Uh, we can combine uh, point clouds. Uh, it's uh, an obvious reason when you have multiple smaller point clouds if you would like to have a single point cloud, but we also can combine uh, practically any geometry to a point cloud. Uh, this is a point cloud made from an RGB image and a DEM. Uh, I combined them into a single raster, a four band raster, and then said make me a point cloud. So this is the result of this uh, transformation. Uh, you can see those two cars, uh, originally they were just a SketchUp model. Again, I injected them into a point cloud, so they are just sets of points. So you can make a very quick, uh, a nice uh, a preview of some project uh, built in a model. And this was another customer request. Yes. Uh, so you, you will hear a few more times that uh, our new functionality is based on customer requests. So if you have uh, texture on your, say, SketchUp model or CTGML model, uh, we also will uh, carry them through, make color uh, point cloud based on uh, texture, texture colors. We can split uh, point clouds. Uh, of course, uh, we support some traditional splitting by uh, return or classification. But uh, another customer request was to split by color ranges. Uh, our customer in Quebec had uh, lots and lots of LiDAR data for their roads. And they said, you know, yellow color is so so clearly seen on, on, on the dark road surface. Why don't you? well, somehow allow us to extract that. So we added splitting by color ranges. So, and here comes our second demo. We will show how can we extract uh, yellow marking on the road. I'm not going to build this uh, workspace. I will just comment uh, 
what we have here in the existing one. So this is kind of a, a, a limited kind of feature extraction, I guess. Yeah. Oh, wow, you're doing some splitting there, I see. Yeah, let's have a look. Let's run it and have a look. So here we say that we, based on RGB values for red, uh, green, and blue, we find p uh, points that are rather yellowish and separate them from the rest of the point cloud. In this case, we read almost 600 million points. And let's, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, 17 million points, uh, 600 um, megabyte file. OK. So only 70 million points. 70 million points, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> A measly 70 well, million. Well, we, 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 can, we can do that. <laughs> so then later we, this is our new transformer called Hull Replacer. Now we can extract concave hulls. OK. Uh, yes, and later we analyze the features that we uh, Found. So if uh, we, we only need long, uh, long thin features, so we measure their circularity and measure their area. So if you have a few autumn leaves uh, on the surface, they won't be count as uh, as road markings. So let's have a look what we what we have here. So once I extracted oh, wow. the road center lines, I elevated them a little bit over the surface so that we can clearly see them. So. Wow, so, that, so you pull out some vectors there. Yes. So, of course, we can clean it a little bit. We can remove spikes or generalize it. But, well, this is not the point. But we can easily and fast uh, extract this road uh, painting. So turn off, can you just turn off the LiDAR? So this is, okay, so that is actually the output of this thing. Yes. Okay. And this is in that inspection tool that we're using to just temporarily check what the situation is before we'd actually write this to GeoDatabase. Um, we can, uh, you already saw this in our first demo, we can colorize uh, data with our point cloud own raster component setter. And here are some results. Uh, oh, hey, I know that scene. That's close to where I live. That must be the Township of Langley. Yes, exactly. So Highway number one. Thanks very much, friends, the Township of Langley, for giving us some really good test data to try out. So this was data that didn't have a color. They gave us ortho photos. We showed them how they could all be combined to make a much more attractive point cloud, I guess. Yeah, and this transformer uh, can be used for uh, not, not uh, only for transferring ortho colors to uh, your point cloud, you can take any raster and transfer any values to your point cloud and send any components, such as, for example, classification. Once I made uh, an example where I had uh, an ortho image where I separated green areas representing grass. I had uh, high vegetation cl class in my point cloud, uh, so I was able to add low vegetation class. And using the building footprints, I was able to classify whatever is inside buildings uh, as a building class. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes when clouds, uh, last or last files, uh, don't have correct uh, extent, so their header does not match actual data. Uh, by enforcing this, we can make sure that your uh, point cloud is displayed correctly. So some viewers can be, well, uh, not that good if they see this problem. I know the audience might be shocked to learn that there are bad data files out there, but you're saying that it is true, Dimitri. Some data files are bad? Yeah, quite, quite I'm, bad. Yeah. I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, for uh, using LiDAR data in ArcGIS, we added this option writing uh, last D file and uh, calculating statistics. Right, so this just speeds up the process if you're using the data interop to make last files, whether it's tiling them, clipping them, whatever it is, then at the same time as we produce output, just like that, we have a last D file. There's no messing around with, with having to create that as a separate step. So, and then quickly, easily, you bring that to our JS environment. So, um, another customer-driven uh, request was uh, extracting uh, slices uh, along some roads. This is a more complex workspace. It, it does not use any new transformers, uh, rather than those that I showed already. 
but let me switch to our last demo. Slicing. Yeah. Well, that should have some interesting math in it, I guess. Okay, so this is, uh, as you can see, a bigger workspace with some custom transformers, these green things, and uh, they are just a collection of uh, standard transformers. Just, you know, you, you make your workspace smaller. Dimitri, you know what? Let's zoom that up. If you hit Control-0, the folks at home may not know that there, then they can see it a little better maybe. But there's lots of pieces to this. But basically, you must read the lines and then um, get the ones that we care about and then basically make perpendicular lines. That must be this cross-sections green thing. Yes. Uh, this is an example of a reconstruction project for a highway where we don't need the whole uh, uh, portion that we are going to reconstruct. Uh, we don't need the whole portion. We just need some uh, uh, slices or, uh, say, 50 meter wide um, sections of this along the highway. So this is a real request from a real customer. Let me just run this. Here we have uh, some DGN files, po uh, some point clouds, uh, GeoTIFF images, and oh no, shape files are the source, and DGN files are the destination. Oh right, they wanted the, a DGN uh, set of cross sections. So we're going to produce DGNs even though we're in ArcGIS, I guess. And uh, what is the what is the imagery used for? Uh, the same imagery as before. To do uh, uh, to oh do to give us to color. Do, yeah, because oh, we're color. colorizing on the way out as well. Is this going to come up in the data inspector, I guess? Yes. Okay, so we're routing it into the data inspection. Oh, no, okay. It must, it must be actually going to visualizers as well. Let me run this. Okay. So we can, we won't, you won't look at this in our scene right now, I guess. Okay. So it's going and thinking about that. There's a lot of computation. And we're going to get a bunch of slices out of yeah, this so original here, uh, here we read uh, highways for the whole county and filter only those that we need. Uh, here we color our point cloud, split it that we only have ground. Uh, we don't need anything else. Uh, then we join lines into a single piece, make cross sections, uh, buffer them so that we could get slices. Uh, and so on. So it shouldn't take long. It's just about 50 seconds. Okay. Can we, um, while we're waiting, can you right click on the source shape files and let's take a peek at them? Because one thing you can do inside of this, oh, just let loose, but anyway. Okay, well, we, we'll uh, see all the answers here. Okay, well, that's, I guess that's, those are the lines we had to begin with. So now we're flipping into 3D mode. Okay, on this so, inspection tool. Okay, so what do you got? Okay, this, that's the area. This, yeah, this is the highway for portion of the highway that we need to reconstruct. Project zone, uh, cross sections. That's the cross section lines, okay. Then the slices. Okay, I can see them appearing. And they're colorful. So, and then these slices can be injected in the CAD application that. Uh, our customer uses to uh, prepare the reconstruction documentation. And they may be useful in ArcGIS. I mean, part of the idea here is to use these slices to just reduce the overall data volume so you can focus in on just what you care about and not deal with the millions and millions of points. That's pretty good, Dimitri. Yeah, so that was our last demo. So some numbers about uh, performance. Uh, we were able to take 1.2 billion point file and tile it into well manageable pieces in about 4 uh, hours, 45 minutes. Clipping is, as I said, a longer operation, uh, but you get precise pieces that you exactly need. After that, instead of a 40 gigabyte file, you get uh, 3 to 5 um, megabyte files, which can be easily managed. Uh, we were able to generate a surface in about 2 hours. And the parallel processing that I mentioned before, sometimes you can go up to five times faster than uh, using just a single process. Right, so there's settings on some of these transformers. Yes, I can show the setting maybe on, on a buffer error. Has that? 
yeah, uh, no, not buffer, clipper. Uh, let me add next clipper. Yes, I think you have to add a new one in for it to. Right. So if we do that, yeah, there we go. So on some of the transformers, there is this uh, parallelism, and you can pull the lever to crank it up or down if you think it's worthwhile. There's an article Dimitri has a link to um, on FMEpedia. And why don't you just go ahead and click that? Whoops. Uh oh, they they have seen something they shouldn't. All right. So if uh, this FMEpedia is a treasure trove of articles, totally applicable to data interop as well. And in this article, Dimitri talks all about the various um, options or uh, characteristics of the parallel processing, where it seems to be a big win and where it doesn't. Yeah, for example, uh, here surface generation, we, we were able to go from five minutes to 28 sec or 26 seconds in one of the modes. Well, that's worth doing. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I hope we uh, were able to show you how you can uh, prepare your LiDAR data for further use and share it. So, but this image below is a sneak peek of what is will be available uh, next year. Um, they've already mentioned that expression evaluation. Now with a single transformer, you will be able to do a transformation like this one. When you can change your components such as classification or color or intensity based on other components, attributes, parameters, expressions, or anything. Right, and this one, what Dimitri has done is basically written a little formula that changes the, or basically tints everything with a, a below as a Z or Z threshold to be bluish, simulating a flood, I guess. Yes. So in other words, if you're thinking of buying property in those areas that are bluish, maybe you should think again. Is that what your conclusion is? Yes, exactly. Just uh, ask uh, what is the highest flood level, enter it as a parameter into this workspace, and you get your, your answer. And it's, it's quite nice to work with that, yes. That's coming soon. All right. So um, we have a, an offer. Of a couple of people were asking about uh, training for this stuff. I will point out that there's uh, virtual campus courses available today for the data interop extension. They are a little bit older, but um, we are in the process of revising those with our ESRI friends. By the end of the fall, there should be two new ones up there. But stuff is there now. You can also help yourself to FME training, and we're willing to give you a couple of uh, Hopefully, I might, I might have lost audio there. I don't know. If, if Roger, can you find out if we're still broadcasting? Um, if not, we'll go to our backup. But anyway, uh, anything that's, a, that's FME training does apply to data interop. And so we're uh, happy to give you some, a chance at some training there. And uh, also, there's some online training that's self-serve that you can, you can use as well. So I think we'll probably uh, stop that there. And uh, there we go. So are, are we uh, still broadcasting? I'm down. So okay, let's well, the phone for a sec. Well, no, let's see if Ro Roger should be able to tell us if we're going. We're just about done anyway. We're going to take a few questions here in the time that's left. Let's see if um, my friend Roger says, OK, he says, all's well. I think he says, all's well. Really, Roger? Okay, so that's good. So anyway, thanks very much for, um, for your interest in the training, and uh, we'll be in touch with you. There's a couple of ES-related ones coming right up. I think as well we have a webinar or two coming up on uh, related to data interrupt. Steve, you're going to be doing a, a webinar. That's right. Yeah, we're going to be doing some uh, uh, a presentation with Scott from ESRI, Scott Oatman, and uh, Steve Versay on local government and how we can get data using FME into the local government data model. Um, that's right. Or data interop as well. Yes, it it works right. equally yeah. as well. So that's all about rearranging data using these tools uh, as you move from one data model to another. It turns out to be a very fast and effective way. On our website, if you like 3D or if you care about data interop in general, the recorded webinars are up there at that link. Uh, there's also an intro movie if you just want to get a, a, a 40,000 foot overview of what the data interop is all about at that link as well. And I think Roger will be sending all these things out to everybody uh, very shortly. Yes, that's this clue here. I think by the end of today or tomorrow you'll get a follow-up email. And also if you're one of our lucky winners for the training, you should be getting an email about that as well.
So here's some uh, contact information, and while that's there, um, Steve, uh, any uh, any particular questions that, that we should really uh, look at? Oh, about I noticed you you uh, flagged down the last versions. Yes. So 1.3. Um, we have no plans to actually to support 1.3. 1.4 we do have plans to do in a, in a future release as well as 2.0. They do, those um, begin to flirt with a more flexible component model. We mentioned, Dimitri mentioned in the part about uh, point clouds are being rasters gone wild, that for a particular point you can't have many measures or many pieces of information. With the existing model in FME and data interop, as well as the old last format, there was a, a fixed set of what those could be, flight line and intensity and so on, red, green, and blue. Uh, in these new LAS and E57, it's a much more flexible model, and so we have to do some plumbing changes to support that as well. So eventually they will be. They uh, only go to 1.2 right now. Also, Mr. Sid. So I do see folks interested in Mr. Sid. We don't support the LIDAR, Mr. Sid, but if you are interested out there on that, please use the chat window or the question window to chime in right now and express your interest because that will help us uh, decide to put more effort into that. Um, we certainly could. And we could work with Esri to work on the licensing side of that because one of the things we always have to watch out is if we do something that's safe that uses a third party library like Mr. Sid, um, we can't just put that into the data interop without Esri also in entering into the same arrangement with the um, with the provider of that third-party library, the Mr. Sid folks. I don't see that that would be a problem, but nonetheless, that would be. What would be a problem is writing to Mr. Sid. That is something that they're not open to uh, third parties doing. If you'd love for other ways to be possible to write besides just using their tool, even if it involves licensing stuff, let them know. We've always been anxious to add Mr. Sid writing into FME and data interop in general but um, and, and of course someone might need to have a commercial arrangement with the Mr. Sid folks, Lizard Tech, but uh, still the workflow might be smoother if that was uh, possible. Dimitri, one person wrote in and said hey they've got a file with spurious Z points in it. So in other words you know everything is should be less than 500 feet but there's some birds out there flying that are um, adding noise into the point cloud what are our options for dealing with that? Well, we have a custom transformer on the Homeopedia. Let me try to find it. Um, filter. Vertical filter. Yeah. I'm not sure whether uh, it is here. But it's a custom transformer that uh, analyzes whether we have any gaps between um, the massive of data uh, and uh, some other points. So if there is a gap, then obviously it's some kind of noise, either a bird or some cloud. Uh, it is available uh, on in FME store, I think. Vertical. Oh, okay. It might be an FME store thing. So then, anyway, we got to find that. I know that also. Um, you can in the next FME you can do cubic clipping. Yes, we, we can do it now. Oh, in this one. Yes. So how would that? What would that? How would they do cubic clipping here? They have to make a box. Y yes, uh, I showed that uh, filtering. Uh, if you maybe go back to that slide, it will probably explain the concept. Yes. This one. Oh, there it is. Yes. Yeah. So you can analyze if you don't have any points and say in this uh, uh, orange box, but you have some points here, it means that you have a gap and you basically don't need what is above this gap. That right. mean, would mean that you have some bird or, or, or point or, or a cloud. But it also you could probably make a, a box that just is, you know, um, 500 meters and below and make a giant cube and then everything that's in there you keep, everything else you throw away. Yes, yes. If you know that, that this is a more complicated version of that same thing. Yes. And what about uh, extracting like a Z value from point clouds? We got a question that's very interesting subject related to extracting the median building height. So I guess you would utilize the classification, find your buildings, and then look at what the heights, the greatest Z values of that. What do you think of that? Well, um, it, it is pretty hard to extract buildings 
if you have some trees uh, around, uh, just uh, uh, but if you have building footprints, that should be fairly easy. Okay. You just clip them out and uh, send through point cloud property extractor, which would tell you the maximum Z value. Great, thanks. So any other questions out there that we should uh, flag? Let's see, whoa, okay. Mm. Okay, folks that are doing that, let's see. Uh, Oh, pod. Yeah, some some. Uh, I think Martin's asked about the point cloud. No, point tools format. That one only works if you have point tools as well. So it needs a third party um, library to be present. And so um, we had to make that arrangement and get everybody on side with that. And so that's what that's the deal with point tools. So that that's that one. And um, somebody's asking how they can buy this software. Well, we love to hear that. Um, data interop extension is available through your Esri channel. So you can talk to them and, uh, and they should be able to set you up. So um, that's good. And um, if, if for some reason you want to also uh, discuss FME with us, you're certainly welcome to do that. But the things we showed today were all data interop. So that's a really nice, happy way to, uh, to end the, <laughs> that's a successful webinar when somebody wants to buy. So. Um, Thank you very much for, for that question. And I think probably we'll wrap it up there. The rest of us uh, will hang around to answer any questions that people may have that dribble in. But um, I want to, first of all, thank on behalf of Safe Software, all of you for tuning in today. I want to thank our friends uh, Bruce Terrell from Esri that work with us and all the folks at Esri to make the data interop as good as it is. There's actually a whole crew here at Safe that make the data interop happen. Curtis Fast, Phil Vera, Phil Savela, um, thanks to all you guys for all the work you do making that work. Of course, we've got a big team here that does all the work with respect to all these algorithms and user interface and everything else. Thanks to them. Thank you, Steve and Mark, for answering questions and helping keep customers happy. We like to say it's safe that we have a restaurant model where we want to make a good product, but we also know that, that you need good service as well because if you go to some restaurant that has great food but you get lousy service, you may not come back. Again, similarly, if the service is fantastic but the food is lousy, you won't be coming either. So we know we need to make both a good product and have good service. And we do like to work with our Esri friends to make sure that Data Interop customers get good service. And lastly, and especially, thank you, Dimitri, for two things. For all of your work as the, really the architect behind all the point cloud functionality and for coming up with inventive ways that we could add things to FME to do some of the operations you've seen today and I know that this is helping a lot of customers and maybe after today helping even more so thank you for all that and thanks so much for putting this together and uh, and getting this ready and for getting here early two days in a row or not quite in a row with a day in the middle um, this and now Steve I guess you're on the hook for a week from now yeah that's right yeah it's not like you slept in today either no, no. <laughs> you've been here actually early so was Mark Stokes yeah. uh, all those days lastly folks if any of you are in Europe I'm headed to Europe for couple weeks of FME World Tour. Absolutely Data Interop customers are welcomed at our World Tour events because all the stuff we're talking about applies to you as well. Uh, we just decided we're going to do a big World Tour again next year in April, so watch for that. Go to the SAFE website. We'll be coming to 15 cities in North America and probably 30 more worldwide. Uh, I myself am off to my friends in Sweden and uh, Denmark. And I can't do an Irish accent. I'm going to Ireland, and I wish I could do a UK accent because I'm finishing up there, and uh, I'm going to be exhausted by the time I get home. I'm not getting here at 7 in the morning anytime soon after that. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be an exhausting September. So anyway, from the Crystal Gondola here in Surrey, British Columbia, this is Dale, Dimitri, Steve, and Mark signing off. Have a great day, and enjoy your point clouds. <laughs>